Okay, hello everybody. My name is Dr. Masri, and uh, I am a, a geriatrician at the uh, uh, Karan C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine and through the Geriatric Workforce Education Program. We'll be talking about heart failure and tips for managing chronic heart failure in the elderly commu community, specifically in the outpatient setting. Okay. So what is heart failure? Often, um, it's the inability to provide adequate cardiac output to the body at rest or with exertion, or to do so only in the setting of elevated cardiac filling pressures. Clinically, this is a syndrome that we often see deemed by breathlessness, fatigue, and edema. A chronic heart failure affects over 10% of people over the age of 70 with a high rate of mortality and morbidity. Often these patients go to the hospital for hosp uh, heart failure related hospitalizations. And at the start, you may see a more rapid increase incidence in men at 60 years old and above. But the incidence in women surpass men after the age of 85 years of age. <clears throat> and there's many faces of heart failure. So um, we often talk about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That's those with an EF less than 40%. And then opposite to that, we have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Those with an EF more than 50%. And then there's a middle ground. And by the way, going back to heart failure with preserved EF, those are often seen in females at advanced ages. So <clears throat> usually uh, that, that's the picture we see with preserved EF. Those with reduced EF, men tend to have um, heart failure with reduced EF. But, you know, the rules can be broken, of course. And then there's a middle ground, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, and those are all the 40 percentiles, percentages, uh, which is 40 to 49%. So these are the many faces of, of heart failure. <clears throat> I just want to emphasize that this is what, what I'm going to be talking about is chronic heart failure. This is not somebody that has decompensated acute heart failure. So how do we manage patients with chronic heart failure in the outpatient setting? First of all, we have to capture the diagnosis. So capturing stable patients with suspected heart failure with uh, the biomarker and terminal pro-BNP and an echocardiogram. So um, according to the NICE guidelines, which is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence guidelines, an NT pro-BNP greater than 2000, um, uh, it, it should be recommended, it is recommended to the NICE guideline that you should get an echocardiogram within two weeks, within two weeks. And um, an NT pro BNP between 400 and 2000, um, you could extend that echocardiogram within six weeks. Okay, these are not hard and fast rules, but these are just guidelines to follow. But there's caveats for using NT pro BNP. So if you're cut off for an end terminal pro BNP to be greater than 400 uh, picograms per nanoliter, you'll miss one in five cases. Okay, so you'll miss one in five cases. So there are some heart failure patients that fall below the 400 mark. Now, if your cutoff is 125, um, <clears throat> you'll capture more of those heart failure patients, but the diagnostic testing of an echocardiogram has increased 25%. Okay. So those are the caveats when you use these uh, low, these cutoff markers. <clears throat> so let's talk about heart failure uh, with reduced EF. Those are those less than 40%. And you probably know the mainstay of um, reduction in mortality and reduction in heart failure hospitalizations are these three medications. One is an ACE inhibitor, which could be somewhat interchangeable with an ARB. Number two is a beta blocker. And number three is a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, which is a diuretic. So we have to uh, educate patients about self-care, self their self-care, measuring their, their weight, their blood pressure, 
and we as physicians and healthcare providers, other healthcare providers, of course, need to um, up titrate the drug treatment, especially if they could tolerate that, um, educate these patients on symptom monitoring and make sure they follow up to optimize these three medications if possible. Okay, so heart failure with reduced EF, beta blockers are a huge mainstay in reduction of heart failure hospitalizations and, and reduced mortality. Um, it doesn't go for all heart, it doesn't go for all beta blockers, but specifically metoprolol succinate rather than the tartrate version Metoprolol L succinate through the Merit HF trial has shown to reduce heart failure hospitalizations and mortality. Carvedilol through Copernicus and Bisoprolol through uh, the Cybus 2 trial um, have all shown to reduce mortality in those with heart failure with reduced EF. ACE inhibitors since the 1980s have clearly shown reduction in heart failure, cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations with reduced EF. The consensus, consensus trial was one of the first trials to show that. They showed enalaprole versus placebo showing a 27% reduction in mortality and NYHA symptoms. Okay, that was the consensus trial. ARBs can be used in place of um, ACE inhibitors if they're intolerant to ACE inhibitors. So the VALHAP trial uh, was a randomized trial of angiotensin receptor blocker valsartan in chronic heart failure that showed reductions in, in mortality and, and hospitalizations, okay? Same with the CHARM alternative trial as well in 2003. And mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, those uh, two that we, we talk about are spironolactone and, and eplerinone, have been shown to reduce... Uh, heart failure, hospitalizations, and mortality. Those are the two primary outcomes that we always look at. And these diuretics should be optimized as much as possible. Um, and, and it's been shown <coughs> uh, with, with the Rouse trial with spironolactone and emphasis trial with aplerinone that it does do that. But keep in mind to avoid um, decompensation of any kidney function uh, so it's recommended that males avoid these medications, the MRA medications, if their creatinine is uh, uh, two or more, and in females, 2.5. And please also to keep in mind the elevations in potassium for those over five millimoles per liter as well. <coughs> so um, MRA, MRA was so effective with reduced EF that uh, this uh, Rouse trial had to be stopped shortly within around the, the two year mark because there was a clear benefit over placebo with spironolactone. And they used patients with um, an EF less than 35%. They were already on an ACE inhibitor. Some of them had loops and some of them uh, had some digoxin as well. So um, this diagram just shows uh, patients with heart failure, what happens um, with uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Gets revved up due to uh, pre-renal azotemia, first of all, uh, which in turn increases the uh, renin angio, uh, angiotensin aldosterone system and that worsens heart failure and cardiac remodel over time. As a compensation, um, the heart produces naturesis and diuresis with brain natriuretic peptide. And that's actually a good thing. So there was a new advent here of neprolysin inhibitors. Neprolysin uh, inhibitors stop the breakdown of brain natriuretic peptide. So that naturesis and diuresis can be continued. So this is fairly new uh, from 2018, not so new, we're in 2021 now, with um, Arnie's angiotensin receptor blocker with a neprolysin inhibitor. And 
with the Paradigm HF trial, it was a study published all the way back in 2014 that showed the Secubitril, which is the neprilysin inhibitor, with Valsartan had better outcomes when, comp when you compared it to an ACE inhibitor with enalapril. And that ARNI decreased cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization due to heart failure. There, were more there, is, there was more hypotension, but there was also less renal fa failure compared to the enalapril and a slower uh, rate of decrease in estimated GFR. With this particular study, it was patients with an EF less than 40%. Their New York Heart, uh, the New York Heart Association classification was between two and four. One arm had enalapril, the other part, the other arm had the RNA secubitril valsartan. Um, and uh, later on, there was more st studies that showed transition pioneer trials that demonstrated that the secubitral valsartan can be initiated early in a wide range of patients with heart failure with reduced EF who were recently admitted for um, acute decompensated heart failure, either in the hospital or shortly after discharge. Um, now, this is not so much the emphasis of this lecture, but acute decompensated heart failure, this is not something that we could work out in, um, in the outpatient setting. So if, if you have a new onset, the acute decompensated heart failure, there's many precipitating factors. Number one probably is hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, number two can be arrhythmia. So it may be worth to do an EKG to rule out an acute myocardial infarction or the, uh, an onset of uh, atrial fibrillation which both can be precipitating factors. A pulmonary embolism can cause acute decompensated heart failure. And then very often non-adherence to those medications, um, the beta blockers, the ACE, the ARBs, and the MRAs can be another reason why one can get acute decompensated heart failure. And those people are usually managed in a, uh, in a hospital setting with uh, aggressive diuresis. Again, you know, the, the lecture here is on chronic heart failure and, and trying to manage, manage them in the outpatient setting so we could avoid mortality, re, so we could reduce mortality and avoid heart failure associated hospitalizations. So again, with acute decompensated heart failure, initiation of diagnosis and treatment must be immediate and uh, physical exam, it's, it's uh, often uh, severe volume overload. Uh, so those that uh, have worsening congestion, even without dyspnea at rest, or signs and symptoms of this, uh, congestion, even in the absence of weight gain, or a major electrolyte disturbance, or their AICD is firing, or symptoms of stroke, TIA, or DKA symptoms, they should go immediately to the hospital. So when a patient is uh, congested severely, they should go straight to the hospital and get a, a, a loop diuretic aggressively. And then trying to optimize all three categories is important as far as um, optimizing medical therapy. So it's very important. Remember that last, um, that last precipitant, which is non-adherence to medication. It's very, very important to talk to our patients about taking their medications every day, whether they feel good or not, because this is what's keeping them stable. So focus on medications that reduce morbidity and mortality. I already spoke about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Um, as far as, again, the NICE guidelines and the European Society of Cardiology uh, from 2016, uh, state that it's okay to up titrate every two weeks now with a very strong focus on whether these patients can tolerate it with their uh, blood pressure so focus make sure they're not hypotensive but it is okay to up titrate every two weeks and then following that uh, one must check their uh, electrolyte and kidney functions one to two weeks after the initiation and then uh, as a guideline monthly for the next three months and then every six months as far as beta blockers, uh, beta blocker can be up titrated no faster than every two weeks. 
and uh, specifically with beta blockers, heart rate needs to be uh, monitored, blood pressure, and the body weight as well. <clears throat> Mineral corticoid receptor blockers, uh, MRA diuretics, you can up titrate every 48 weeks. Again, uh, very important to check hyperkalemia and renal function one week, one week after up titrating. Monthly for the next three months, every three months for a year, then every four months indefinitely. So that's three times a year. <coughs> Arnie's. Um, so an ACE inhibitor or an ARB can be changed out to an angiotensin receptor blocker with a neprilysin inhibitor. Um, and usually we ask for specialist supervision, uh, cardiology and uh, specifically to check for blood pressure, renal function, and hyperkalemia. And uh, one, one of the important rules is especially with an ACE inhibitor, specifically with an ACE inhibitor, there should be a 36 hour washout period before starting Secubitril Valsartan. So if someone is on Anelopril, uh, one must wait 36 hours before starting Secubitril Valsartan. Why is that? Because a, a, a neprilysin inhibitor, the Secubitril portion of this medication actually increases bradykinin, much like an ACE inhibitor. So it's an additive effect if you introduce secubitril, uh, secubitril um, when one was on an ACE inhibitor. And that increases bradykinin, bradykinin dramatically, and that could increase the risk of angioedema, severe angioedema, and death. Therefore, there should be a 36-hour washout period. Historically, they first tried this medication with an ACE inhibitor. So it was Secubitril with another ACE inhibitor. And uh, they noticed severe angioedema associated with it. And that is the reason why they combined Secubitril with an ARB, specifically Valsart. So um, it, 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 if anyone's curious about that, that's the reason why Secubitril is coupled with an ARB. Now, if you're going to change over a patient that formerly was on an ARB, um, there's no need for a washout or a waiting period. So you don't need to have a washout period with an ARB. You could change, you know, the uh, formerly Valsartan or whatever ARB they were on to uh, the Scubitro Valsartan the very next day. Okay. Blood pressure has to be monitored just to make sure they're uh, tolerating this medication or all, all three medications. And um, keep in mind, hypertension is associated with an increased risk of developing heart failure and acute decompensation. Okay, so very important to control blood pressure. Clinicians may want to switch some of their blood pressure medications that cause edema, for example, a calcium channel blocker, to an ACE inhibitor to combat, or an ARNI, of course, to combat peripheral edema caused by calcium channel blockers, for example. Um, and it, it's very important to uh, get rid of all those medications that may cause uh, uh, edema buildup, for example, NSAIDs. Okay. The SPRINT trial, as far as blood pressure, uh, showed that uh, those, they compared uh, blood pressures of, a, of patients with 140 millimeters of mercury versus 120 in, in those patients 50 years old and above with cardiovascular risk factors without diabetes. And um, it showed that the aggressive blood pressure lowering in the 120 branch, the 120 millimeter of mercury um, arm showed reduced heart failure hospitalizations by 38%. But it's really, as far as geri geriatric care goes, it's really a delicate balance whether these patients can tolerate lower blood pressures. But we have to also uh, accept the fact that the study showed a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations with the lower blood pressure bracket, the, the 120 millimeter mark, rather than 140. Aside from heart failure, shortness of breath could be attributed to other things, obesity and lung issues such as COPD, 
certain morbidities may limit the use of heart failure medications. So some medications may uh, come into conflict with heart failure medications. So a beta blocker, for example, uh, may come into, uh, may be an issue with one who takes a long acting beta agonist for their COPD or a short acting beta agonist. So certain medications indicate for these comorbidities may worsen heart failure. Okay. Um, so many of the comorbidities are associated with poor outcomes when combined with a diagnosis of heart failure. Then there's a long list. Um, if, if you look up a study from circulation in 2016, um, they have a whole list of drugs that may cause or exacerbate heart failure. Okay, and this is from the American Heart Association. Um, heart failure and heart rate have, some, have an association as well. So they showed in patients with coronary artery disease with left ventricular dysfunction, a heart rate of 70 beats per minute or higher was associated with a 34% increased risk of cardiovascular de death and a 53% increase in admission to hospital for heart failure compared with those that had a heart failure lower than 70 beats per minute. Okay. Um, yeah, and that was the, um, the beautiful trial. It was called the beautiful trial back in 2008, where they made that association between left ventricular systolic function and heart rate. So <clears throat> how do we mitigate this? Uh, well, there was a study called the SHIFT trial that showed that uh, those with an EF, this is, these are heart failed pa patients with an EF less than 35% and greater than 70 beats per minute, and it had to be in sinus rhythm, uh, that were maximized on beta blockers, uh, had an added benefit when we added this new medication called ivabradine. And ivabradine is a selective inhibitor of the IF current, the funny curtain current in the sinoatrial node. It exclusively inhibits the SA node pacemaker activity in a rate dependent manner if these patients are in sinus rhythm. Okay, so this is not a, you know, a patient that's in atrial fibrillation. This is a patient exclusively in sinus rhythm with an elevated heart rate greater than 70. There is a added benefit for those with heart failure with reduced EF. Again, reducing mortality and hospitalizations. And uh, Ivabradine exclusively slows down the heart rate. It does not affect blood pressure whatsoever. Um, and this is all through the IF current, the funny current. Okay, so here's, here's the study with Ivabradine, the relative risk of the primary endpoint with cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization fell by 18% compared to placebo. And I wanna also point out that Ivabradine is not a replacement for beta blockers. So these are patients that are already maximized as much as they can tolerate on beta blockers and their heart rates are still over 70. So maybe adding Ivabradine can add an added benefit with primary endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. Now, there are current studies that uh, are looking at Ivabradine in heart failure with preserved EF. Those are those greater than 50% EF, okay? And uh, it seems like there's a neutral study with that, unfortunately but more studies are, are being tested, okay? Uh, continuing with heart failure with reduced EF, SGLT2 inhibitors are being studied in heart failure with reduced EF, uh, specifically dabagliflozin. And these are patients, again, with an EF less than 40%, New York Heart Association between two and four, and they are maximized on a medication, which is a SGL2 inhibitor called dabagliflozin, 10 milligrams. And these patients can have diabetes in the study. And there were plenty of patients also that did not have diabetes. And whether they had diabetes or not, there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death 
or worsening heart failure. 20, 26% relative risk reduction as well as all-cause mortality reduction by 17%. Um, so we're looking also at uh, SGL2 inhibitor medications in heart failure with preserved EF through the DELIVER trial and the EMPEROR trial preserved. Okay, so it's now these medications are being looked at with half path the preserved EF as well, but um, the studies are not quite out yet, but the study is clear with heart failure with reduced EF. It, it decreases heart failure hospitalizations and all-cause all mortality. So it can be used as a uh, one of the armamentariums for um, uh, for heart failure with reduced EF. Now, how about those with a reduced EF of 35% that have symptomatic heart failure despite three or more months of trying to optimize these patients on the three mainstays of, uh, of optimized medical treatment? So we've tried, for example, um, a patient that still have symptoms despite the up titrating of ACE inhibitors or ARBs or an ARNI along with a beta blocker and a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. After three months, there's still another option. And that's when we enter device therapy. Given that this patient is, ex given that this patient is expected to survive lo longer than one year with good functional status. So again, as a geriatrician or somebody who takes care of geriatric patients, um, one has to pan out and take a look at all the overall health of the patient. Does this patient, is this patient expected to survive longer than one year? And um, do they have an EF less than 35% and they're optimized on, on the medical treatment for more than three months? They may be candidates for an ICD, okay? And, and ICD as a device therapy has been shown to reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death and ventricular arrhythmias. Here we go. This is an EKG um, in sinus rhythm. However, uh, we see widened QRS, widened QRS here uh, diffusely. So another form of device therapy could be cardio re resynchronization therapy, CRT. And those are for those reserved, again, with patients, those that are reserved for um, an EF less than 40% and a left bundle branch block, okay? And the left bundle branch block is, a, is, is a significant for dysynchrony of the ventricles. So what a cardio resynchronization therapy device would do was try to mitigate the problem of dysynchrony of the ventricles. In attempt to resynchronize the ventricles, uh, it's been shown to reduce mortality and improve overall the EF, okay? So a biventricular, it's a biventricular pacemaker that has the capability of pacing by itself, or it also has the um, capability of pacing and defibrillating as well. So the European Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Guidelines recommend CRT for symptomatic patients with heart failure with an EF less than or equal to 35% with a left bundle branch QRS morphology in sinus rhythm um, with 150 milliseconds or more. Okay, that's a grade one recommendation, grade one, one A recommendation rather. And um, those with a left bundle branch block of uh, 130 to 149 milliseconds with an EF less than 35% can be considered as well. That's a one B recommendation. Okay, so um, that's from a 2006 study from the European Journal of Heart Failure. Now, that is quite a lot of weapons that can be used against heart failure with reduced EF. Uh, several medications, right? So the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, uh, device therapy, uh, I'm sorry, dabacliflozin, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, I didn't mention the ARNIs, Secubitril Valsartan, and then two device therapies, ICD and uh, CRT. But when it comes to heart failure with preserved EF, unfortunately, there's a lot less weaponry against it. 
So heart failure with, with a preserved EF greater than 50% EF. 70% uh, of heart failure patients in the primary care have heart failure with preserved EF. And unfortunately, um, a lot of these patients are elderly and tend to be female. Okay. And sometimes it's hard to capture heart failure clinically with preserved EF. Okay. So this is a little tool. It's called half pap score um, found in circulation from 2018. So these are some clinical clues that may show um, one that uh, is increased risk of developing half pap or may have half pap. So if one is heavy with a uh, BMI greater than 30, that's hypertensive on two or more hypertensive medic antihypertensive medications that has atrial fibrillation, whether it's paroxysmal or persistent, that may have pulmonary hypertension um, per the echocardiogram when measuring a pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Uh, one that's elderly and it's often pointing to a female or has elevated filling pressures uh, marked by the EE prime greater than nine. Okay, um, <clears throat> would, would, are all, all clinical variables that point to a higher likelihood of developing half path. So this is a very nice um, acronym and, and uh, scoring calculator that can be used uh, if one suspects half path. So comorbidities and heart failure with preserved EF. Two main ones, I should mention also a third one, hypertension, diabetes are very common in half path, and obesity is another strong uh, comorbidity with half path. Loop diuretics may be helpful reduce, to reduce the symptoms of half path, um, but do they reduce mortality? No, they don't. Um, the CHARM Preserve trial recruited uh, patients with an EF greater than 40%. Now, technically, that's not uh, entirely half path. It, it actually falls under the, the middle ground of uh, heart failure with mid-range EF. But they, regardless, it's, it was not heart failure with reduced EF. And the primary endpoints were cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations. They measured candesartan, which is a ARB versus placebo. And unfortunately, with half PEF, or at least those with EF greater than 40%, there were neutral outcomes. So it did not reduce death nor hospitalizations. I preserved trial, unfortunately, used uh, a very similar format there using arbisartan, um, herbisartan rather, versus placebo, and unfortunately, again, a neutral trial. The TopCat trial uh, was interesting. It utilized uh, spironolactone, MRAs. So do MRAs, uh, MRA inhibitors, reduce heart failure, hospitalizations, and death in, in those with half PEF? So um, they recruited a whole bunch of patients from various nations, the Americas, Europe, Russia, Georgia, and these patients were studied for three years. And the primary outcome was a few things. It was cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalizations, heart failure associated hospitalizations, and aborted cardiac arrest. Okay. And these patients had an EF greater than 45%. Their creatinine was less than 2.5%. So, you know, were they eligible for the MRAs? Um, they used spironolactone. The reason why they used spironolactone in uh, the TopCat trial was because of expense. The plerinone is known to be a little bit, is known to be plenty more expensive than spironolactone. And they compared spironolactone to placebo with these patients with, that were hospitalized for heart failure in the last year in the form of... Uh, the hospitalization or uh, those with an elevated NT pro BNP. Okay, but again, EF has to be greater than 45. And unfortunately, with MRAs, and again, we're talking about half PAF preserved EF, the overall outcome was neutral. Cardiovascular death showed no statistical difference. Um, and there was some. Uh, statistical significance 
in reduction in heart failure hospitalizations or, uh, or heart failure associated hospitalizations. But there was plenty of um, criticism of this, of this large uh, test because they noticed that placebo in Russia and Georgia had very low mortality, which is not, uh, it's not often seen in heart failure patients. It was only 2%. And um, that begged the question whether these patients that were recruited truly had heart failure, okay? And there, the placebo hospitalization rate was quite low as well. It was only, it was less than 1%. It's not compatible with uh, the other rates seen elsewhere. For example, in the Americas, um, the mortality rates and the hospitalization rates were much higher than the placebo. So, this still is a, a question of whether, um, you know, do MRAs have a role in in um, in those with heart failure would preserve DF? Because it is, it's question. These this test, at least with the placebo in Russia and Georgia, was a bit questionable. So they're still looking at it. There's another trial called Spirit Trial, half path, um, that should be out very shortly. Um, and uh, it's the spirit half path trial. So that's something that they have to look after because right now, currently, there's not a lot of, uh, there, there are no medications really that we, we could think of that reduce heart failure hospitalizations with half path. Here's another trial, and I, I already gave the spoiler away, but again, they measured um, those with uh, an EF greater than 45%, not entirely half path, but um, they're not reduced EF patients. And one arm had Valsartan, okay, at 160 milligrams of BID. The other one had an Arnie, um, Secubitro Valsartan, twice a day as well. And this was the Paragon HF trial. And their primary endpoint, again, heart failure associated hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. They measured 4,000 patients with, um, with, uh, what is deemed most, a lot of them preserve, would preserve DF. And these were quite a lot of patients. It was 4,000 patients involved. And there was a 13% risk reduction. And unfortunately, it just missed statistical significance. So re, you know that uh, statistics, statistical significance is uh, p-value less than 0 0.05. Well, this was a p-value of 0 0.059. So it just missed clinical significance. So this is this was unfortunately a borderline test, but otherwise it was neutral. Okay, so there was no statistical significance in this trial called Paragon HF. There was several secondary endpoints that were examined. Okay, uh, they noticed improvement in the NYHA classification for those that were on an ARNI Secubitril Valsartan. Quality of life was better in the Secubitril Valsartan arm renal failure was less in the Secubitril Valsartan arm. And there was somewhat of an effect difference in females and those with an EF 57% or below. Okay, but these are secondary endpoints. Um, as far as the study goes, this is still a neutral trial. Okay, but this is something, this is just like kind of unpeeling the onion that perhaps they need to take a look at Secubitril Valsartan uh, with those with an EF less than 57%, which was their median EF, and um, perhaps those, perhaps females as well. Uh, so that's just something uh, that can be re-examined as well. But again, Paragon HF is a neutral trial. As I said, right? Females and those with an EF less than 57%, may have some statistical significance, but it warrants further investigation. Like I said before at the beginning, half pet is twice as common in women than men in, in a lot of studies. And that could be attributed to smaller ventricle chambers, poor diastolic function, higher prevalence of uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction and some hormonal changes. So, like I just to sum, summate everything, half path has no disease modify, modifying medications that we know of right now. 
but we know that the uh, risk factors found that hypertension and obesity were large risk factors in, in females that had had that. And that counted for two thirds of the risk. So hypertension and obesity, unfortunately, um, was a huge problem. And with women specifically, uh, trying to achieve target blood pressure was a huge problem. Okay, well, unfortunately, statistically, only 20, 29% of women older than 70% in that study had adequate blood pressure control. So what does that mean? I think one of the lessons there is we have to, when it comes to half path, we have to focus on uh, we have to focus on preventative medicine. We have to re we have to focus perhaps at earlier stages so they don't progress to heart failure with preserved DF. So controlling blood pressure, reducing weight, controlling blood sugars are huge uh, huge factors to control. These are variable things that we can control. Uh, so we're not kicking the bucket down the down the street to the point where they are end stage in heart failure or even preventing, perhaps preventing heart failure. So the focus with half path really is good aging, you know, healthy aging, controlling blood pressure, controlling weight, redu reduction in weight and, and sugar control as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the last things I, I want to also mention is pay attention and try to pan out to your patients uh, especially if they still have all these clinical signs, despite optimized medical treatment, you've tried everything. They're still exhibiting a lot of symptoms. They're still in class three for New York Heart Association um, class, despite everything you've done. They're still progressively debilitating, debilitated with shortness of breath and fatigue, and they are spiraling, you know, forward and back from uh, frequent hospitalizations and graduating to a skilled nursing facility and going back home and going back to the hospital and, and possibly getting institutionalized in a nursing home due to their heart failure. Or they're having worsening renal function despite doing everything you can. Uh, or they're having weight loss and they're wasting away. Or they're intolerant to the medications that you're prescribing and there's not many options left. Uh, so every time uh, one goes to the hospital or has a bout, has an acute exacerbation, advanced care planning should be initiated early in the disease course. I often talk to patients uh, that, that are stable. So we don't talk about these very serious subjects as, as advanced care planning is when they're short of breath and, uh, they don't have all their faculties together. It's better to talk to them when there's no emergency so they can think a little bit more clearly. And, and these advanced care planning should be discussed frequently. Um, goals of therapy should be discussed and revisited probably every time one has an, an exacerbation or one goes to the hospital from, uh, for overload or, or they just decompensate. So these things are not just a one-time thing. They should be discussed over and over again and revisited. Okay, so that's, there is a, there's a role of end of life care, definitely with heart failure. Okay. Um, I want you to, I, wa I want to thank you for listening to all those, uh, all the, all that subject. Uh, it's quite tough to listen to overall, but uh, because of all the studies, but I, the purpose of that is for you to optimize your um, your knowledge in in managing patients with heart chronic heart failure in an outpatient setting for the purposes of improving quality of life, prevent hospitalizations, and and decrease mortality. So, uh, hopefully, this helped, and I would be grateful if you complete the following. Uh, so you you can do a small survey on your web browser by using this uh, address here. If you have any questions, this is my email, hattie at nova.edu, and the QR code is below. So thank you so much.